welcome to this last uh, video lecture of this uh, third module of the Norton Data course. Um, I'm uh, quickly summarizing on IDF schema and related to other vocabularies and finally show an example how we can now integrate data in IDF also using IDF uh, schema. So to summarize, the web of data is really meaningless unless we uh, add information to it, uh, knowledge, rich knowledge that we can interpret with formal semantics in order to turn the data into knowledge and information. Um, RDF is a language that comes with such formal semantics for its operators and is basically also the first way of distinguishing between uh, different uh, classical KR knowledge representation uh, uh, types, namely classes, properties, and instances. Um, the classes are describing sets of uh, objects that have similar properties. The properties are relations between objects and the instances are the objects themselves. And basically the, we use this language in order to describe both the schema and the data because uh, we can talk about individuals that have certain properties that would then be instances and classes related, but we can also uh, talk about the schema, so the classes themselves. Um, this all works because we have in RDF schema a set of reserved symbols, like RDF class, RDF subclass, RDF subproperty, and so forth. And uh, the important thing is that these symbols come with the formal semantics, like the ones we did introduce in the first uh, uh, two modules. Uh, and uh, based on this form of semantics, we have a notion of entailment. And now we can uh, implement this entailment in, an, uh, in, a pragma in, a, in a practical way. And we do this using inference rules. Um, so the inference rules apply on these reserved symbols and allow us to, um, to really produce new facts. So just inferencing is the application of inference rules to formula that we know to produce new facts. And uh, the, the, the important thing is that these inferencing rules, they produce entailed formulae and all the entailed formulae and only entailed formulae. So in IDF schema, this is uh, possible and it's, it's not too difficult to implement such inference rules. Um, as RDF schema is not very impress expressive, so there is only a certain amount of things that you can say. It's not very complex. And we'll see next week a language OWL, the web ontology language, where you can say a lot more with the big disadvantage that what you say is far more difficult to do this inferencing over. But that's uh, what we're going to talk about next week. So. RDF basically is a family also of uh, vocabularies or integrates a number of vocabularies. Uh, first, we have the proper RDF vocabulary and RDFS. Uh, that is really the terms that describe the data model. And then we have a number of vocabularies that are uh, there to describe domain information. And there are things such as friend of a friend, the FOV vocabulary, which is about persons and relations between persons, Dublin Core, which allows us to talk about bibliographic attributes. Bibipedia is really a, um, at the heart of the web of data because it really is a, an encyclopedic uh, source based on Wikipedia that is incredibly rich and uh, really one of the standards everybody uses. We have geonames for locations, data cube for statistical data, SCOS, which is very often used in museums and libraries to describe concept hierarchies and mappings. And finally, we have a, a rich ontology language, uh, OWL, uh, to describe formal constraints on class membership. Um, first, the, let's talk about RDF vocabulary and RDFS vocabulary, because uh, in a way, the, the interesting thing is that they are just as any other vocabulary that you define, you need to declare it properly, the namespaces. You need to use the namespaces um, as described above here, because this is where they are sort of standardized, that they are always the same and what they are going to mean. Um, this is the namespace that you use for RDF, and the prefix is usually RDF. You have to declare, like any other uh, prefix, also the RDF prefix. And then you have important elements such as RDF type, which links a resource to a type. RDF resource is a type of all the resources, and then the property is a type of all the properties. 
And this allows you to give information to an object, URI, uh, sorry, a resource, uh, Geo Amsterdam, namely that is of type resource. Um, you can say that um, uh, the contained in Geo uh, resource is of type property and RDF type is a property as well. So we can even manipulate the RDF vocabulary itself by RDF. RDFS is a slight extension of this and there now we have the interesting fact that the vocabulary comes with the form of semantics so they are uh, interpretable according to these semantics and allow us for predictable inference. Again you need to define the namespace and use the prefix RDFS this time. Um, and then we have, we have a vocabulary for describing thing, that things are classes, how they are related, they are subclasses of each other. So these are two things to relate classes, define classes and relate classes. We have things that uh, define or uh, constrain properties such as the domain and the range property. Uh, we have special class, uh, classes such as resource and literal, which is very handy. And there are more that you don't need that often. RDF as label is very important, comment is very important. And these are really coming with the form of semantics to allow us to have rich logical consequences, inferences that we can derive based on the notion of entailment. Another vocabulary is FOF, which is very often used and which comes with a sort of social semantics, as we explained previously, because people agree on how to use them. And this one is meant for describing uh, people and the relations they have with other people. So it's used, very often used for describing social networks. So um, uh, we say that someone is a person, alive, dead, imaginary, whatever. Uh, it comes with a name, it comes with an email address, it knows someone else, so this is the means to build the social network. And um, there, are, there are more elements in the vocabulary, but not that much more. So that, for example, Rinke, he's of type person, and he knows someone else at the VU, and he has a name, which is a string. And because we use this, uh, this vocabulary, everybody else who sees this knows what this is supposed to mean. And that doesn't mean that you can formally semantically derive anything from this because fourth person does not say anything about what person is but at least many people agree on using this so that you can um, query for this in an interesting way similarly the dublin core vocabulary is uh, uh, practically standard for describing data about documents and about uh, books and creations. So you have a creator predicate, you have a created predicate which gives a date, you have a description which is a natural language description, and a description like the title. So here's the example of the FU, the, the semantic web primer. It has been created by Rinke on a certain date and it has a certain title where the date is a literal and also the t title is a literal, namely a string in this case. There are more of those vocabularies and you're high, it's highly recommended to use those vocabularies whenever you model your own data. Because then if people see it, they will reuse your data because they know what you're sort of meant to, to, to mean by those. So you've learned how to use Sparkle, you've learned how to make your own linked data. I now want to give a quick example of uh, now you, that you've defined your own vocabulary and linked data, how to integrate the data and how to make use of RDFS for doing so. So the example that we're looking into comes from a data integration problem using Facebook and IMDB. And the Facebook publishes data um, in, uh, with an, an API, which you can access and you get JSON objects back. Um, and IMDB does, does the same. So this is the IMDB API. You can uh, ask a query in a certain format and the data format that is supported that you can back is in JSON. This is all very handy. So this is the, the example of the IMDB JSON that you get back. Unfortunately, these two formats are not compatible. So they are different in the description. So one way forward is to transform both of them into RDF. So here you transform uh, Facebook into RDF. And this is more or less the same. You can do this automatically. So you create a Facebook graph and you link some objects with some other things. This might be a person and these are uh, movies. 
if you look at the, the interpretation of it. And then you do the same for, for IMTB, where you translate the JSON objects into RDF. And we'll show a little bit how this works. Uh, um, it's, it's a bit of a programming effort, but there are libraries for helping you with this again. So this is very useful when you do this later. And basically you get two RDF graphs that are both, uh, have both been created from JSON and that are now um, more easy to combine. And let's see how we do this. So the, the first naive thing is it's just put them in one document and then you have Facebook statements. So the Facebook object likes another Facebook object and this Facebook object is described um, by a name and a category. And you have another object now from IMDB. And basically you see when you, when you, when you read this, Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas, that it describes the same object. But IMDB cannot know this maybe can look at the, uh, sorry, not IMDB, but, but the, 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 this data set uh, and a computer program cannot know this. So uh, it could look automatically trying to match the labels. And this is also what people do in practice. But uh, let's see how we can avoid this need for automatic matching by reusing the, the, the information and by modeling in a clever way. So the first thing we can do is that instead of using a link from a Facebook object to another Facebook object that we reuse the information that we have from IMDb. So instead of saying Facebook 5944 like some other Facebook object, we refer directly to an IMDb object. And now we have already made a very, very simple but very powerful link between the two data sets. So this is the reuse other people's URIs in your programs, which works here very nicely. An alternative is that you create your own objects and you sort of copy the data from another um, uh, resource into your own data. So this would be a, a purpose-built uh, uh, fear and loathing in Las Vegas uh, object that has been created for my own application. And this is very useful when you want to add information that is, is locally valid for your own inter interpretation, but not necessarily for the whole world. So here you, uh, are easy, you can easily adapt and add more information to these, this information. Another way of doing this is that you, um, you keep the statements intact. So you say uh, the Facebook object person likes a certain thing, which we know is a movie, uh, and we leave the IMDb information intact. And then we say we link these two using the SCOS vocabulary. And the SCOS vocabulary tells us not formally, but in a semi-formal way that the, the, the two things that it relates are, have to be more or less the same. So that we can, in a query, that we can use this information and ask for things that are more or less the same. And here you then combine this movie information from Facebook with the movie information from IMDb. And this is already very powerful when you write a Sparkle query that you can now combine a Facebook object with a, a subquery with an IMDb object. Now we can also use uh, subclass of in order to get more results and more, more res interesting results based on the interpretation of the uh, vocabulary of RDFS. So here we have information that this Facebook object is of type movie. And here we have information that this Facebook type is of type community. So if you now look for a uh, something that is of type movie. Um, so basically we look for all the titles of things that are um, in a Facebook movie relation, then we should get back um, this object uh, and we get the title of it back, which is Waking Life. We won't get anything else because um, the second one, Zeitgeist, is not in a movie class, but it's in the community class. So this is, uh, gives us one result back. If we now know that the meaning, the proper meaning of the Facebook community class is that it's a subclass of movies, so that this is a community that is about movies, then if we ask the same query, which now understands the, the subclass relation, if we ask the same question to give us back the titles of the movies that are movies according to Facebook movie, then suddenly we get this one back as well. So we get an extended 
result set back. And why is this the case? Because we look for everything that's a movie. We know that everything that's a community is also a movie. So when we see this information that this object with the name Zeitgeist is of type community, we can infer that it's also of type movie. And then we know that it should also be returned. If we now ask the query um, for things that are in, the, in an ISA relation, so that of type movie, to a Facebook um, type of information that have been created by, by transforming uh, the data table into something that's related by a category uh, relation property, then we don't get any results. So because your Sparkle query looks in the table and it looks for anything that is matched by an, an RDF A, so RDF type relation, and there's nothing that is related by an RDF type relation. Still, we know that a category in the interpretation of Facebook is in a way a description of a, of a type. So if we add the information that the category information in Facebook here is a subproperty of the type information, then with the same question, the same query ask, we now get the two results that we wanted. So basically, depending on the interpretation of this Facebook category relation property, as a subproperty of type, we now get the information that these two things, Zeitgeist and Waking Life, are of type movie. And not only in the category movie, but also of type movie. So these are very simple examples how you can, depending on the interpretation of the properties, for example, that come from the transformation of, of Facebook, you can combine this into uh, powerful queries that give us more results than you would simply find in the transformed data set itself. The last example is making use of the uh, domain uh, information. So we have someone who likes many things. And basically, the restriction that we can give is that everything that is in a subject position of the likes relation must be a person. So then the question is, if we see something, uh, this object, nine, uh, five, nine, four, four, eight, six, six, three, five, then we want to know what type it has, then we can automatically derive that it's a person, even though this is not directly specified in our little database. And this can be very useful again in general to find new information, but it can also be very important when you combine data sets. Mm -hmm.